And it's 1 p.m., the new time for you to get updates from the world of business. It's Happy New Year for me. It's the first time I'm on the show in 2024. I know Laddie has been doing a good job on it. And by now, you're getting used to having 55 minutes of business stories, current and relevant around the world here on Business Incorporated. Here's what we have for you on the show today. Nigeria's stock market hits a new high at intraday, now be below above 79,000. Bad news from the Suez Canal as 20% of traffic reduced in less than two weeks. And in Kenya is a risk of 10%. $1,000 fine for airlines. Find out why. Great to have you on the show, Amini John McCorn. Welcome to this cruise that's going to take you 55 minutes around the world and giving you market numbers and beyond that. We start from here in Nigeria with the global space. We tell you that Chicago soybean features edge higher on Friday, but the market was on track for a third weekly decline as much needed rains across Brazil and forces. Let's look at the number right there on the screen. We we see that it's good one for wheat, which is up 0.5% thanks to the rains there at $6.16 for a bushel. Khan is also up, though smaller than that, 0.1%, $4.66 for a bushel. Soybeans also up 0.1% at $4.66 for a bushel. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the rains doing this at this time. Past, the past several days across Brazil's oil seal uh, uh, growing regions have reduced concerns about crop losses in the world's largest uh, crop producers. Now let's move over to the global oil space and see what's happening there. We know, of course, that the Red Sea and activities around there is still a major driver. It's hedge high on Friday. Uh, minutes from a Federal Reserve meeting suggested inflation was under control as the United States uh, State Antony Blinken prepared to visit the Middle East to try and prevent Israel Gaza. Looking at the numbers right there, we see that Brent is up 0.4%, $77.91 a barrel. WTI is also up 0.6% at $72.62. I must mention that as of yesterday, Brent had hit, uh, gone above $78. Uh, so this is a recovery uh, today. Uh, both benchmarks are set to uh, end the first week of the year high had they had nearly recouped all losses from Thursday when prices settled lower while minutes of the Fed meeting did not provide direct clues about what interest rates might commence and the discussion signal a growing sense that inflation is on the control. That's in the United States, uh, not in Nigeria. Come, and talking about Nigeria, we head back home right here and tell you that the revenue target for the Nigeria Customs Service for the year 2024 is 5.8 trillion naira and it seems like the leadership of the service is not resting on its arse to see uh, to this tour order the controller general of the nigeria customs service mr lawali adeni made the clarification during the declaration of newly promoted officers of the service in abuja he explains that uh, all hands must be on deck to raise the bar in terms of revenue generation border security and full automation of its collection processes. We are now in 2024 and we face daunting challenges. Our challenges in an economy that continuously looks forward to the Nigeria Customs Service to generate revenue to fund our national budget. As at the last time, if it is not changed, the revenue projection for the customs in 2024 stands at 5.1 trillion. We are still compiling what we have done in 2023. I believe that we just went a little above 3 trillion. By the time we finalize the numbers, we are going to make it public by next week. But as we start the new year, I want our newly promoted officers working with other officers to lead the charge 
for the realization of this budget. I want all, all, all of us to bring our stakeholders to the heart of our operations. We have a country where economic operators, importers, exporters, where they depend a lot on our processes, on our commitments, on our efficiency for their own business. We cannot afford to disappoint these stakeholders. We cannot afford to disappoint the economy. We cannot afford to disappoint the president who has given us this opportunity and, and uh, special privilege. So the year is still fresh. It's a good time. I know, I don't know about, uh, uh, you know, all those resolutions and all of that for the year, but I know it's a good time to set your calendar, your investment calendar going, set it on at this time. But which way should you look when we look at the diverse uh, opportunities or platforms available for investment? That's what we are going to do now, talking about investment strategy outlook for the year 2024 in Nigeria especially, but then also outside Nigeria. Now joining us to have this conversation all the way from AfroInvest is Robert Obotunde. He joins us now uh, to, uh, I mean, you prepared this. Hi, Robert. Uh, Happy New Year. Same to you. So good to have My you. So I see that you shared this with me earlier, and I guess I didn't want to be stingy, so I decided we share it with, uh, you know, our, our, our viewers. So um, this year, uh, first of all, when you look at the investment climate for mm. Nigeria and mm. Sub-Saharan Africa, I see you're really interested in Sub-Saharan Africa there. Absolutely. Uh, how would you describe it? I know we had a lot of interest rate hike, uh, inflation, devaluation of currencies, and all of those affect investment, investment climate. So how would you describe 2023 before we head into 2024? Thank you. Very good questions, I must say. Um, there are two themes. The investment climate is getting tougher and then it's getting global so those two things are very important for any investor who wants to really optimize returns in 2024 now i say it's getting tougher because globally we are seeing a lot of risk factors coming up and you just mentioned the biggest of them inflation in fact if you ask me what was the biggest phenomenon in 2023 that affected the global economy it was inflation Inflation in the U.S., in the Eurozone, and look at the U.S., for example. That's an economy that would typically print inflation around 2% levels, peaked at 9.1%. You know, the Eurozone, it was as high as 106 for, you know... Uh, well, I mean, the towards the end of the year, we saw it... Take no, 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 I'm just telling you the peak. For Bank of England, for example, it was as you know, high as 10% um, uh, levels or, you know, uh, there about, I mean, 11% levels there about. Now, but we now started seeing significant moderation, I would say as well, significant moderation. You know, the U.S. inflation, for example, that peaked as high as 9.1%, closed the year at 3.2%. So that is the basis for what we are looking at into 2024 mm. and those things that would shape the investment climate in 2024. In but let's not forget, it's getting tougher but it's also growing global. Okay, so let's, you talk about inflation. We also, I think you also have a slide for inflation in Nigeria, uh, if, if we could have that also, inflation in Nigeria. Unfortunately, in the case of Nigeria, yeah. we do not see it uh, going down, uh, well, you know? All right, so, so that's it, the one for Nigeria. Yeah. And we see that uh, this is at the end, this is October, your steps are October. Absolutely. We see at 27 now, of course, we've gone past this one for November at 28. And we saw that, okay, there was a little bit of tapering here. Mm -hmm. That was around February, June, October. And, but I mean, I don't think it's really showed. Everybody was cash trapped and purchasing power had already reduced. And I don't think a lot of people... So, so this tapering you saw was 2018, 2019. So the whole of 2022... We saw it creeping up and up. So, so that's 2023. You know, up, I mean, 2023. I mean, going into 2023. Have we peaked? Creeping up. Have we peaked? Well, I wouldn't say we have peaked because if you look at all the other pressure points, you know, uh, until we know what is happening to insecurity, we may not be able to tell how high food prices could get. Until we are sure what the exchange rate outlook is, we are not be able. To, we may not be able to tell what imported inflation would have 
to the CPI basket, you know. And there are several other pressure points, you know. Uh, thankfully, we have global oil prices moderating. But even though it's moderating, exchange rate is an element in that pound price, which can also, also take it higher. As we speak, to be honest with you, I am not sure we're charging a market reflective pump price for petrol as we speak. <laughs> you know, the issue of so, subsidies so, is exactly. something we so, don't want to go By the time into. that is done, you know, you're going to see more pressure coming on inflation. Mm, and know? that's why I, I was in yesterday. We yes. had to have uh, both the NNPCL and the private uh, oil guys coming out to tell us, oh, we're not increasing. Because if you do a normal calculation, you would find out that we are not paying for... And, and you know, you know <laughs> any, that's where the problem is for a country like ours. You know, we all talk about what the issues are, what the problems we are facing, and how we need to get out of them. Government is struggling. I mean, look at the, the budget of government. They are, they are pr practically struggling to raise the revenue. You know, we are leveraging on, uh, okay, uh, finance minister says there won't be leverage on the central bank this time around, but we are going to still have but to But we already borrow. securitized yeah. how much for, for I mean, ways and means. Yeah, so just think about that. So now, if all of those problems exist, I think that since we got out of subsidy, we should have just taken the bull by the horn and hold sway so that we are not, you know, bedeviled by that uh, conundrum. It's, it's, it's been with us for, for so long, and I just imagine that we could have taken it out, completely out, in 2023. I think that would be really but, harsh. A lot of Nigerians would not you know, want to so, hear you So say let me that tell you, the, the, I think the problem here is that we're saying it's harsh because we're doing one good thing, but we don't want to follow it with other good things. There are so many things we are still trying to pamper all the problems that you know are facing the country we are not taking them all you know in at the same time and this is what is really needed because nigeria is like a country that has gone through a terminal disease you know and you are seeing all the symptoms in inflation in unemployment in slow growth and all of the issues that is facing the country now if you're going to get us out of that system there are hard drugs that you're going to have to apply these drugs are very they can be painful you know, some of them will bring with it a lot of signs and symptoms that you will not like. But if you shy away from taking those drugs, we are not going to come out of that terminal illness. <laughs> and that is the problem here. You and, know, and all of this, yes. all of this obviously affects the investment climate. Absolutely. If we could have, uh, you know, the one we had before the slide, uh, looking at the sub-Saharan uh, um, investment environment, looking at euro bond. Yeah, so there you have it. I don't know why you brought up the 10-year treasury yields, perhaps that's that something that we should look out for yes. uh, this year? And we also see right here Nigeria and BRICS market. Absolutely. I, I, I've not been hearing a lot about BRICS these okay. days. So, so what's going on here is the 10-year yield is the benchmark for tracking most dollar-denominated assets. Remember, euro bonds are bonds in the sub-Saharan African, issued by the sovereigns in the sub-Saharan African market, but are denominated mostly in US dollars. Some of them are euros. You know, we don't want to go into the history of how euro bonds come up, I mean, came about, you know, because, I mean, originally it was issued in euros, but as we speak, it's mostly in, in USD. So Nigeria, for example, is in the euro bonds market. I think we have about uh, $15 billion uh, worth of euro bonds outstanding in that market now but that market is not really looking at nigerian inflation what is really looking at is u.s 10-year yield because that's the benchmark so what you see is that i mean we talk about u.s inflation picking and then moderating that moderation is directly reflective on the pricing of sub-saharan african market and by the way in the last three years since covid you know after we came out of covid in should i say 2021 you've seen new pressure point brought about by inflation which are presented a lot of opportunities in terms of asset prices you know asset prices came up from their peak and they dropped so significantly and in 2023 towards the end of 2023 so i seen significant recovery but there's still more room for benefit in 2024 so are you saying it's a place that investors that's, could oh that's 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 where the that's where the gold is Yo, let, let me say and one of the places <laughs> one of the places and, and where the gold case, is in 2024 in this case, uh, yeah. the, the the thing is it could be a shield for you a hedge against nigeria's definitely, inflation definitely it shields you hedges you and you know you have a number of dollar denominated fund regulated by Securities and Exchange Commission. You don't want me to market myself here. <laughs> you know, Afri Invest has one there, you know, that you can invest in as little as $500, $1,000, you know, you can put. And these are, you know, 
should I say, relatively safer uh, investment opportunities that also prevent or protect you, so to speak, against inflation that may be brought about by exchange rate depreciation. Hmm. You know the way you said five hundred, one thousand dollars. <laughs> it tells me that <laughs> tells me that Robert, you, you're one, you're one, to, you're one area to look at. But what are the no, other? No, no, but, but, but speaking to that seriously, Nigerians have a lot of money that we throw around. You know, really? one thousand dollars. So I mean, all this cry for shortage of I mean, dollar is artificial. Uh, well, to some extent, it, hmm. it, it is. Because, you know, in an environment that is uncertain in terms of where the inflation outlook is, you know, dollar, dollarization is one of the, should I say, symptoms that you find. Because everyone is trying to protect. And people are rational, you know. The problem is that government always thinks that people should not do certain things because, you know, for patriotism, so to speak. But it's a market, you know. As a matter of fact, speculative activities is what drives every market that is, you know, really thriving. So in the foreign exchange market as well, speculation is allowed. What the government needs to do is to ensure that you have a market process that prevents speculators from, you know, you know, um, damaging whatever efforts you are putting in place to stabilize the economy. Mm. But that you will not have speculators, we should forget about. All right, so what are the other windows available for investment? So investment opportunity in this, you know, you know, I was saying something about, you know, it's getting tougher and it's getting global. The tough part of it is that, you know, you need to be discerning. You know, you have to be an investor that can really read in between the lines. You have to study trends. You have to study, you know, there are a lot of things that we cannot bother an average investor out there. You know, so one of the things you must take very seriously in 2024 is that have your investment partner. You know, those that have done the job, they've done the dirty job of understanding the, the times and season, if I can put it that way. Because we believe that 2024 is a season for reaping the returns on your investment. But in doing that, you will have to be strategic. Strategic means that you must, you know, in the, amidst the bouquet of your know, portfolio of products available, you have to design as to which one you're going to pick. Then I mentioned the word global. Global in the sense that if you sp stick to Nigerian instruments alone, Nigerian instruments here will be you are either investing in a placement or with a bank or in a money market fund. But stocks, our stocks market is doing you know, well. Right? Well, that's Very what I'm saying. Or you are investing in the stock market. But you know, um, in 2023 we had an impressive performance. We think that we can still build on that. Uh, and by the way, my fund was the best performing in the market. <laughs> there you go again, telling yourself, please to charge you, Robert. <laughs> you know, but in 2024, we can build up on that momentum. You know, but we are saying that you cannot just even stick to Naira investment opportunities alone. Now, you were just talking about Sub-Saharan Africa market, for example. There are other opportunities out there that you can, you know. But like I said, you have to partner with your, because some of us don't even know how to go about this. Invest if I want to invest in SSC, We have the money, we can buy the services. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 opportunities will exist, particularly in the fixed income space, because both locally and globally, the fixed income space had been at the receiving end of higher inflation, you know, and interest rate hikes from the Central Bank of Nigeria, I mean, the Monetary Policy Authority and other, you know, uh, monetary policy authorities, systemic monetary policy authorities, you know, globally. So, but in 2024, everybody is singing, bring down the interest rate, bring down the interest rate. The implication of that is that if you are invested, and I say 2023 was the best time to invest, but January this year is still is a good next, time. Is the next best yes, time. Yes, it's still a good time to invest. You understand? Because the opportunity is But, but is now, that, yeah. now that, um, uh, as you also talked about the issue of interest rates, and we see the Absolutely. dollar gaining, we see talks about um, reduction in interest rates in the U.S., which we know controls the dollar, that is more of Absolutely. a global currency. Yeah. How does that affect the entrance or, you know, profits? from the, the fixed well, well, so, you know, the dollar market is such that, you know, I mean, uh, the government will always talk about you can't dollarize the economy, you know, but some investors earn in dollars, right? So, I mean, you have people staying in this country and earning their funds in USD. If you have dollar investment, you know, perhaps this is a time to deploy. And, you know, you don't talk about exchange rate risk if your earning is, you know, in dollars. And if you have your earnings in dollars, you know, you can put them into investable use that will give you something better returns than you will even earn if you were to invest directly in the United States or any of those con countries where you have, you know, the... And now you countries. have a lot of apps that allow you to go across borders. I guess that's Absolutely. one of the things you meant about... Yeah, 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 yes. You don't want me to market myself, no, no, but no, I would have told you one. No, so I, I won't say it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Robert Amortin, the right, Investment you. Officer at Afro Invest. Thank you so much thank you. for your time. And, uh, all right, thank you.
Thank you for coming. All right, so the program is not over yet. What we'll just do is take a break. When we come back, talking about investment opportunities, the market, and a whole lot more, you want to stay here on Business Incorporated. Welcome back. Still watching Business Incorporated right here on Channels Television. Well, we're talking about investment opportunities and platforms available to you in 2024, Will Ebon has more. I think she has really exciting news because I saw in the tease, one of the stories is that at intraday, the NGX hit another, I think it's one day and one, you guys the, should be the, careful. The, the, I can't you even explain what's careful. happening at the NGX. It's more like- This bubble is- Well, let's just hope this bubble just remains for a little while because <laughs> we do need this bubble right now. Because just look at it, in one week, after the holidays, the yes. year holidays. I mean, the we market started the year with 74. Now we're at 79. 79 in it. And okay. this is, we didn't trade on Monday, yes? No, we didn't. That's so a public it was holiday. Just Tuesday. And Tuesday till Thursday. And we're wow. seeing, and Friday, it's like investors are on fire. Stocks are just being like hot potatoes. I think, being, I mean, I don't know if you saw that number that between September and November, you had more than 100% increase in foreign investors into the market. Definitely. And, you know, the, the projection is that more are still coming so i guess people just want to take their stance take position <laughs> before you know it's in there and just take my profit <laughs> let me and take my money well definitely but let's just see how the markets performed and other trading markets yes. in africa we're seeing key markets in africa we're trading with mixed sentiments we're talking about the ngx and the gsc nigeria's ngx was still in positive territory coming off yesterday's high of 78 hitting another high of 79,000 points today up 1.69 percent and I'm still climbing. I think history is being made here. Stocks, we see stocks such as Ico Insurance, CI Leasing, Infinity Mortgage, Transcore, Unity Bank are on full bid today. Now let's look at South Africa's market, see how they traded. On the other hand, it was down at intraday. It was, you know, and then closing Thursdays, after closing Thursday's session in the green. Now let's look at the EGX. It closed on Thursday. Um, for the week and then we see the Nairobi Securities Exchange also closing in the green on Thursday. Now let's see how, let's check out what's happening at the FMDQ Exchange, what's happening at the NGX, let's see how it has filtered through to the bonds market and how this has impacted trading there. The NGX super normal performance this week, I'm sure it has some effect and some impact there. The fixed income markets, the rates and the outlook remain mixed ahead of next week's OMO and TB primary market auction and this is going to be the first for the year but we're being joined by Caleb Alimi is a chief dealer at Providence Bank. Caleb good afternoon it's good to have you on the program. Good afternoon Will thank you for having me. Caleb I'm sure you just you've heard what we're talking about the bull has been raging at the NGX this week's stocks have been have had historically delivered higher returns than bonds or treasury bills and uh, yet to date I'm sure it was at last I checked it was about 4.3 percent right now I'm sure it's climbing do you think yields in the fixed income market can match up with equities considering inflation rates which is likely to keep trending up and the time value of money it's unlikely. I mean, historically, like you mentioned, the equities market would always outperform the fixed income market. You know, I mean, the fixed income market is for those who are largely risk averse, you know, and then the equities market for those with a bigger risk appetite. And then what we're seeing in the current NGX is, I mean, it's, it's exciting. What more can I say? Look, it's just, it's, 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 it's interesting, really. I think uh, part of the things that maybe playing out could be fear of missing out. You know, um, perhaps the expectation of the uh, foreign investors coming back, you know, coming fully or coming more, more of them coming to the market is also yes. driving that market. You know, however, in the fixed income space, we don't see, we don't expect that to happen. There has never been a time where fixed income yields, you know, outperform the inflation. You know, given all the things that we expect to happen this year, you know, we think inflation will still remain elevated, you know, interest rates will still remain elevated, but we don't think, you know, returns on the fixed income space will outperform inflation. Okay, so with that in mind, what instruments are investors playing at, at, in, at intraday? What is, um, what's the most favored instrument at the moment? Our interest. Oh, I think we lost Caleb there, but we, we I having mean that. Okay, Caleb, can you I think about it. Can you continue? Yes. So I said on the bond space, you know, we've seen demand at the mid to long end of the curve from the 2027, the 2028 papers, 2029 maturity, you know, 2030.
1957, we're seeing investors demand all of these papers. And then also at the long end, the 2050, as we've seen it, you know, shrink about uh, 35 basis points from, from where it closed last year. You know, and then on the treasury bill space, Okay, I think we have lost Caleb there. Interference but in my network, apologies. Okay. Are you still there, Caleb? Yes, very much. Okay, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I was saying that in the treasury bill space, at the short end of at the, at the one-year paper space, we've seen that one shrink about 300 basis points from where it closed last year. You know, it closed about 12.24% at the last uh, primary, auction, primary auction, and this year is already trading around the 9% handle. So, I mean... Okay. And that's because the interbank market is very, very liquid. City market is up about 870 billion. You know, despite the fact that there've been uh, CRR debits, you know, there's still a lot of inflow in the market. But there's still a lot of liquidity in the market. Those who continue to chase, you know, these one-year treasury bill papers before the auction next week, where we expect, you know, the DMO and the CBN to set the tone for interest rates. Uh, Omo is expected. We anticipate that, given how liquidity is, there will be an Omo auction. But Omo is strictly at the discretion of the central bank so that is not guaranteed but we hope that it comes along and it helps us you know set the tone for interest rates but the entity space there'll be an auction next week the volume on offer is not large and given where the one-year paper is already trading out in the secondary market we expect that it may shrink for that you know given the size on, on offer at the auction so let's say what you just said in summary is that investors should not be looking to um huge interest rates or stop rates at the auctions is going to be more subdued. Is that what you're saying, Caleb? Correct. Given what, given what we've seen, you know, uh, for the year so far, that's what we expect. The mm. interest rates will shrink at the next one year auction. Thank you so much, uh, Caleb Alimi, Chief Dealer of Providence Bank. We do hope that um, interest rates match what in equities, well, maybe somehow I'll try to catch up with the equities market because investors are definitely <laughs> cashing out there. Thank you so much, Caleb Alimi, for joining Thank us you this, for afternoon, me. this afternoon. So now let's see major other equities in the Middle East, how they performed. Most of them were closed on Thursday, except in the UAE, where we see the stocks trading negative. Abu Dhabi down 0.01%. Dubai also down 0.11% at intraday. But let's see, still within the region, we see Qatar and Saudi Arabia closing yesterday for the week in positive territory. Qatar, Saudi Arabia was up 0.1.82%. Qatar, Ever it is also in the green, but I think that is a miss up there. Now let's look at the Asia markets and see how they perform. They were mixed on Friday after falling for the first few trading days of the year, with most markets clocking declines at the end of the first week of this year. And data also from Japan showing that the contraction in its private sector activity had stopped in December. Japan's Nikkei 225 jumped up 0.27 percent, and this marks the first gain the Nikkei had since Japan's New Year's earthquake and jaw flight collision in the first two days of the year. South Korea's cost we see it, however, in the red, finishing at 2,578 points. We're seeing the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index falling 0.66%. And after Shanghai, if we look at that, dropped 0.85%. And the Australia's S&P, I um, mean, Australia's ASX 200 also dropping slightly 0.07%. Now, the um, stocks have been declining for a third straight now. I'm still talking about the Australia markets dropping for a third straight day now. The index is down 1.3% for the week. Now, let's look at the U.S. and see how they performed uh, in pre-market trading. U.S. market stock futures slipped earlier Friday ahead of key jobs data as Wall Street tries to shake off a sluggish start to January. They've not had a very good for the start of 2024. Now, futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average made a quick recovery up 0.03%, but S&P and Nasdaq were in the red, falling 0.34% and 0.56% respectively. Now, the moves come after the S&P 500 and Nasdaq Composite declined for their fourth and fifth straight negative session on Thursday. Now, let's get more details of yesterday's close from our correspondent, Maria Bird. The U.S. stock market had a dismal start to the beginning of 2024, and Thursday was no different. As the U.S. stock market continued to fall, as the Dow Jones was just above flatline at 0.03%, the S&P 500 was down at 0.3%, and the heavy tech Nasdaq was down at 0.56%. The heavy tech industries are showing some bit of a challenge, especially Apple, as their ratings have decreased. 
Investors are also watching to see what will happen in the weeks and days ahead, as it does not seem hopeful that the Federal Reserve will reduce interest rates by March. They are stating that we should see interest rate cuts in 2024, but no time soon, as inflation is still showing to be creeping up a bit. It is also clear that investors are watching to see what will happen with the U.S. jobs report on Friday. This could be a sign to the health of the economy, whether it show an uptick or we can seem to see a bit of a challenge in 2024. Thanks, Maria. Now, just looking at what's still happening in the U.S., one of the things that have been weighing on the markets are the tech stocks. They've been, really been dropping. We see Apple dropped, Microsoft dropped, Amazon's dropping. And this is because, you know, investors have gotten to the point that being optimistic in the market, they're seeing a lot of cuts, especially for Apple. That downgrade from Barclays yes. has really dampened that investors' confidence. That was like two confidence. days ago. I'm yes, still really. so, And two research shops have really downgraded them. So they're like, investors are like, oh, I think we should time to just pull back for now and just wait and see what happens. Mm, and I wonder what will happen like uh, Tesla. We know in Europe, for instance, uh, the strike uh, from Tesla and the withdrawal and all of that. But we haven't seen it affect the market so much. Well, we're seeing that, you know, China's market, the BYD, the EV market there is really picking up. And, you know, Tesla is going to have a run for its money very I soon. I guess. 2024 <laughs> is a different year. Yeah. Thank you so much, Will. <laughs> All right, talking about Europe now, let's uh, go back there. The story from there today is that uh, the real estate sector seems to be attracting some investment, while on the flip side, rentage is going high. And, uh, you know, mortgage and all of that residents are the ones feeling the brunt. But let's have uh, joining us to give us the details of that uh, um, Wada Imran, uh, DW correspondent, joining us from Berlin. Hi, Wada. So, Paint the picture for us, the real estate sector in Germany and Europe at this time. Thanks for having me, Ini. The residential real estate market here is quite peculiar. Over half of the total population here rents. They don't own houses. The home ownership rate here is less than 47%, and it's fallen from over 52% a decade ago. This means that there is a huge market for rental homes. There is a similar trend which is observed in other European countries like France, for example. Now, because of the size of the investment opportunities in the rental sector, investors are often keen to pour their money in real estate in Europe, especially in Germany. But there are no silver bullets in this market. And much bureaucracy, bottlenecks, red tape on construction levels, changing policies, create a difficult investment environment. Mm. The current German government had said that they would build hundreds of thousands of homes each year, affordable. Obviously, this did not pull through. But they also wanted to ease building rules to boost construction. But with really high costs and interest rates, investor sentiment remains cautious. Germany's largest landlord company, Vonovia, said that policies have a direct impact on whether more or less buildings are constructed. Hmm. Well, interest rates should be cooling this year, so we'll see what that happens there. But looking at the larger Europe, how is that? Germany is by no means unique in its problems. The whole of Europe faces very similar issues, with many, especially young families or young couples, bearing the brunt of extraordinary costs of owning homes. Even a household of, let's say, three or four people, two parents, two children, with two stable incomes and with savings, find it hard to buy a home. Housing projects are being shelved for various reasons, and this is across Europe. Lack of money, lack of permits. In Spain, for example, approvals for projects can take up to a year or more. There seems to be a big sorry, there seems to be a big gap between supply and demand, and no easy fix. Policymakers and market specialists will have to work together to pull through. Yeah, sounds like Nigeria too. But let's look at the markets and see what investors are doing. Well, besides keeping their eyes on the real estate market in Europe, investors are also eyeing the industry in China as well. A new concern has sprung up as logistic storage spaces lie vacant in the mainland. This reflects on China's economy because the occupants of these spaces would come from manufacturing and trade industries, and the vacancies reflect an absence of those. 
Globally, investors are holding their breath for more U.S. economic data, like employment data expected later today, to assess the likeliness of rate cuts. All right, thank you so much uh, for that. For the week, I would say, we had, uh, have a great weekend. Now let's go to Kenya, where travelers visiting Kenya on a visa-free entry program will be required to apply for electronic travel authorization, that's ETA, before boarding any airline. This is according to a new bill proposed by the Ministry of Interior and Coordination of the National Government for a visa-free entry program. The Immigration Amendment Regulation Bill 2023 proposed the introduction of Advanced Passenger Information, API, onboarding a specific aircraft showing their security database. If passed into law, the new bill will see airlines that fail to provide accurate information about the passengers on board find $10,000. That's about 1.57 million shillings, Kenyan shillings. According to the bill, the information captured in the ETA will show passenger status on acts of terrorism, participation in criminal organization, trafficking in human beings, sexual offenses, including exploitation of children, illicit trafficking in narcotics, weapons and exclusive explosives, corruption, fraud and laundering of proceeds of crime. And we're still staying in Kenya with threats of fine as uh, Kenya farmers and traders risk being fined 20,000 shillings or six month jail term for selling animal feeds without a license. The proposals are contained in the Livestock Bill 2023, sponsored by the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries. If the bill is passed into law, a business operator or any person cannot engage in any production, manufacturing, processing, storage, transport or distribution of animal feeds unless that person has been validly registered and issued a registration certificate in Kenya. The license will be valid for a year and those who fail to acquire it will face stiff penalties that could significantly impact those striving to make a living. So it's a new year in Kenya with a whole lot, you know, of uh, laws right there. Now, shipping traffic through the Suez Canal fell 20% just between December the 24th and January the 2nd compared to a year ago. That's according to Port's Watch platform after shipping companies began rerouting vessels in response to attacks by Yemen's Houthis. From December the 15th, when Maersk became the first shipper to announce diversions until January the 2nd, the most recent date for which International Monetary Fund's Port Watch has data, the number of tankers and cargo ships passing through the crucial shipping lane fell by 10%. But seven-day averages only began dipping on December the 24th as the numbers of shippers foregoing the crucial time and fuel-saving routes around Africa swelled. Other major companies to have announced diversion of ships following missile and drone attacks by the Iran-aligned Houthis include Hapang Lloyd and MSC. The Suez Canal is an important source of dollar revenues for cash-strapped Egypt but canal authorities have not commented on any loss in revenue. Now let's get more on this. Uh, joining us from Cairo, the capital of Egypt, we have Dr. Adele Abdumuslimani. He's the chairman of Evergreen Egypt United. He uh, joins us virtually, obviously. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Adele. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We are welcome and thanks for having me. Good to have you. So we've been, we've been talking a whole lot about, you know, the Suez Canal and, you know, the impact. And now we've seen shipping activities have dropped by 20% in less than two weeks. For you as a business person in Egypt, how is this affecting you, your business and, and runnings? Let us say first, yes, as your report said, the Suez Canal, uh, the most important navigation artery linking the trade between East and West. Uh, now, uh, when Houthi and uh, the war in Gaza happened, this make a big damage because last year is 20% of the total uh, trade, uh, global trade volume passed by uh, Suez Canal. 
This time, 20% of that come less now because a lot of uh, shipping lines stop to pass by Suez Canal and other shipping lines and, uh, make the insurance very expensive. That actually uh, uh, impacts our business by very hard way. We have a lot of trade coming from China and from uh, other countries in the uh, Far East. All this trade now is almost, not, all not stopped, but almost stopped because the container used to be 3,000, <coughs> sorry, used to be $3,000 for one container from China, any, any seaboard in China to Egypt. Now the container was $12,000. So that is a lot of heavy cost for the uh, on our on us as an importer and on the last consumer. By the way, mm -hmm. so that's big damage. So but I'm we hope that uh, the international co collision will be uh, effective in uh, breaking the Babel Mandab and uh, uh, entrance of the Red Sea. So, have we? Uh, are you feeling? I mean, have you seen this translating to? higher prices of goods or services in Egypt? Has that started happening? Uh, transferred to higher price of goods and rare of goods, actually, because uh, many of the shipping lines already bus uh, uh, from Cape Town, not from Suez Canal, and the other which come to Suez Canal increase the insurance by very high way. So both damage we have, both impact for our business in Egypt, we have by what happened from Houthi in the entrance of Red Sea. Mm. And it, it looks like there's nothing the governments in Egypt can do about this because, I mean, the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, these are more of global trade routes and not just a government controlling. Actually, we're looking forward to two things. First, the, the war in Gaza will not, st will not continue for, for no end. And the second, uh, the international uh, uh, global uh, countries, including Egypt, can do something in uh, Babel Mandab to stop such a kind of attack from Houthi to the uh, shipping lines. All right, uh, Dr. Adel Al Muslimani, thank you so much. Uh, the chairman of Evergreen Egypt United. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts You're welcome. With us this afternoon. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, we move to Egypt now, where the country's import of yellow corn dropped by nearly 25% year on year. That was in 2023 to 6.3 million tons compared to 8.3 million tons uh, right there. The decrease in corn import was because of a foreign currency shortage, just like Nigeria, as Egypt is importing all its needs of corn required for the food industry. The Egyptian Poultry Association obviously is on the top of this and crying out for help. And they're asking that this drop in import has affected the price of food as needed for developing the livestock industry. Well, uh, I, I must say, connected to what Dr. Adele has just told us about. Well, it's time to switch gears right now and go to the crypto space and see what's happening right there. But, you know, before we get to the numbers, it would be good to see um, one top story that has been going on. There. Another ETF, Bitcoin ETF, um, is uh, very big in the news. But we also would tell you, uh, if we could have that uh, news, the Logan Paul, Logan Paul, there you have it, the NTF buyback attack by Logan Paul is, is uh, uh, he's really re getting a lot of reactions. So uh, he is known, that's Logan Paul. He is known uh, to be an American YouTuber, uh, best known for his popular, impulsive podcast and proactively tackling the aftermath of his crypto zoo NFT project. And uh, he's showing strong dedication to his investors. Logan Paul is committing over $2.3 million for the buyback back of base EGG and base animal NFTs at their initial selling prices. And um, we've, we've had a lot of reactions to that. We've had a lot of reactions following that. And uh, one of that I, we have from uh, Tom Caker. He's also a YouTuber and owner of the attorney 
Tom and Associates Law Firm. He says that Logan Paul's announcement to buy back crypto zoo NFTs is filled with a bunch of inaccuracies. You know, this um, money guys in the crypto space, you know? Uh, okay, there we have it. That's, that's it. Uh, Logan Paul he says he's incredibly happy to announce that he's delivering on his promise to buy back Bayes EGG and Bayes Animal Crypto Zoo NFTs for their original purchase price. This buyback program is being carried out at eggnftbuyback.com and, and I said he's gotten a lot of lash uh, over this. <laughs> I wonder what it will mean for the market and how investors are taking it. But another thing that is big on uh, the news, the crypto space, is the Bitcoin ETF. But let's look at the prices first before we get to uh, Gilbert to tell us. Let's have the prices. Uh, there you have it. Bitcoin has recovered yesterday. It was about 42,000. Uh, now we see it's back gained almost two and a half percent at $44,085.46 right there. So you might have just made about $2. Uh, depends if you are able to buy one full Bitcoin. You know what I'm saying? Ethereum is also up 1.86 at $2,263.32. BNB, however, is in the red. Now let's look, let's look at the charts with, uh, with the full numbers or the full prices. Uh, there, it's, it's still a greedy market. Uh, we have not changed right there. Uh, so there, you, BNB is uh, down 0.49%. Cardano is down almost 2%. And then XRP. I wonder if we have Gilbert to help us explain what's going on. Um, how come Cardano and X uh, has not, and uh, BNB has not been able to latch on to this huge recovery in 24 hours that we saw on Bitcoin? Hi, Gilbert. Are you there? Good afternoon. Yes, I'm here. Good afternoon. All right. So, Gilbert, tell us what happened. Uh, we see Bitcoin has recovered, but Cardano and BNB have not. How did they miss the train? There is always seasonality and timing when it gets to the market. So uh, no, not every asset move alongside with themselves. You know, some assets are correlated to themselves, some are correlated to Bitcoin, others are not. So what investors must always do if they are in any asset is they need to understand seasonality and timing. This does not mean that uh, Cardano and XRP will not have their fair share of the price surge that is taking place or the recovery. And though it could, one other thing we could see as well could be when XRP and Cardano will be having their own uh, price surge, that may be when we will see Bitcoin uh, and other uh, cryptocurrencies having their downside because, you know, uh, an asset does not go up forever, neither does it go down forever forever no range forever mm. so what's just happening is we just need to wait for timing these are solid assets xrp just had its its victory in court you know back-to-back -back victory and then uh the uh, development technological development is still advanced community becoming stronger and bigger than it's been before so we will still see a recovery and also an upside surge still gets to these other assets that are not uh, having their own surge for now mm. but what news i mean yesterday almost about this time uh bitcoin was still about forty-two thousand, and then now it's gained more than two percent was there anything that pushed it that fast okay you, you know the story about the metric sport uh, this is actually the story of uh, of an analyst who found himself in the center of our conversation by predicting that there will be a bitcoin uh, if there will be a rejection of the bitcoin etf you know this went very viral quickly and uh, the the founder of uh, metric sport had to come and do a disclaimer that uh, this stance does not uh, represent the views of metric sport, but rather the views of its analysts. The thing is, this analyst is a respected uh, analyst in the firm, you know, and I also share the same view. I also think uh, there is a larger likelihood of a rejection of the spot ET ETF. But the thing is, this actually triggered over a 9% drawdown, which we saw, you know, the drawdown that happened, it fueled the uh, uncertainty uh, in, in the market. But this uh, activity really serve more as a case study for me on the impact of news and rumor in the market, raising also question on the vulnerability of external influence in the, in the market. Uh, you know, for over 100 billion being wiped out of the market. And we have seen this before in the case of Cointelegraph. 
when Coin Telegraph gave us the news that the sports uh, ETF had been approved and we saw a major surge, you know, this event actually highlighted the need for investors to critically evaluate their new source. And probably I I'm looking more of an advocacy for a regulatory framework as well uh, within within the space. But so far, the bounce back happened because uh, the, the drawdown that happened was nothing to be scared about. Bitcoin actually broke out of an ascending triangle. So typically what happens is after a breakout, you know, a retest, it's normal for a retest to happen, but uh, the retest broke uh, the support below the support level, but got back within the range of the ascending triangle. And so seeing this upsurge, is, it isn't surprising at the end of the day. Yeah, so um, what do we see Bitcoin doing this weekend? Uh, 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 do we see it continue in this recovery pattern? I know, I know we are aiming for, I think the, the highest I've heard is 75 for Bitcoin <laughs> this year. Do we see it going straight there? We still have a lot of uh, setbacks. Okay, uh, on the longer time frame, there are a lot of exciting news around uh, Bitcoin. The ETF is, is here, Bitcoin halving as well is here. We also see investors are excited about what's happening. There's more regulatory clarity as well in the marketplace. But when I look at what should we expect this week and probably next week, Bitcoin is in a range. It's in a range of an ascending triangle. And as long as it remains in this range and in this structure, uh, 47 and a half, which is 47,500, uh, has a very large likelihood of playing i think this is our next target for uh for bit for the price of bitcoin there are possibilities we may see 48 but i'm just trying to be uh, very minimalist the market is structured for us to see a 47 500 any moment from now on wow that'll, that'll be good that'll be good but and we know that a lot is happening to the dollar and the us and of course these are driving factors for bitcoin Oh, yes. A lot of things happening in the U.S. But the thing is, even though there are a lot of uncertainties, you know, at macro level and what is happening in the U.S., we cannot forget the fact that these, uh, the Feds just drove down inflation from uh, about 9% down to about 3% right now. And even though they retreated their commitment to do whatever it takes to keep inflation to 2%, but this year we are expecting more of rate court. And these are positive news for uh, the cryptocurrency market, as well as the entire market in, in general. Uh, and moving also to the election, we are not about to see the president of America, if you understand history, go into the election with high uh, red court. He is supposed to package the market well, you know, <laughs> and not make uh, the market looks bad while he's going to the election. Whatsoever needs to be done to make, you know, they can't keep increasing red forever. Things are going to become more difficult for uh, the consumers there and uh, middle middle men and also the poor men. So uh, it's it's very important they start cutting rate. And once we start seeing this rate cut, the the market is going to react more positively at the end of the day. All right, many positive drivers for Bitcoin and crypto market generally. Thank you so much, Gilbert, and have a great weekend. And you too. All right, so that's where we draw the curtains on the program uh, today. Thank you so much for being a part of the repackage, robust uh, capital. Oh, my world. You know, even I am struggling. I've gotten so used to that. But this repackage business incorporated of 55 minutes, um, I know and I hope it's been worth your while. Remember, you can always watch the program when you go to our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com forward slash channels web. And then you can watch Business Incorporated and some past episodes of Business Morning. I can't seem to let it go. You know, so you can watch it at any time on our website. And remember to join Laddie Williams tomorrow for business for capital market. That's where we expatiate on the markets for the week. So you don't want to miss that 7 p.m. Laddie Williams will be here. I'm off for the weekend. Gladly, I'll see you next week. God's grace. I'm Amy John McQuarrie.